This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. I spent a number of years as a broke musician, living in various share houses around the place. And some of those houses I really loved, and I still call many of my old housemates close friends to this day. But other houses felt like living in a minefield where you would do anything you could to avoid bumping into your roommate as he stands in the kitchen blaring his motivational audiobooks from his tinny phone speaker at 6am in the morning. These less than ideal housemates weren't bad people, just very different to myself. They had different habits and customs and objectives, but being forced to live in a small space with them just amplified even the smallest problems. The thing is though, that I could and did move out of those places. But not everyone has that luxury. Some people are forced to share their entire homeland with groups that openly talk with hostility about them. Where your ethnicity or religion could dictate whether parts of your own country are safe for you to simply exist. For many people who live in Bosnia and Herzegovina, this is the reality. The country is a microcosm of tension inside a region famously known for tension. And is the site of some of the worst mass killings Europe has endured since the end of the Second World War. Your standards as a majority Muslim Bosniak, or a majority Catholic Croatian, or a majority Orthodox Serb can decide who you're allowed to vote for, which countries support you, and which countries actively arm and support others who seek to hurt you. It can decide what school you go to, what neighborhoods you live in, and where you can work. But this solution is still better than what they had. Before the Dayton Peace Agreements, Fighting and shooting in the streets had become rampant, and the worst of people came out in droves. But to stop the killing and the fighting, NATO intervened, and depending on who you ask, either negotiated a ceasefire to save lives, or imposed their wasted will upon a sovereign nation. For research on this piece, I contacted friends and colleagues of mine from both the Bosnian, Croat, and Serb areas of Bosnia, and I asked them the same few questions. And depending on where they were from, The answers, even the pages of history, would be completely different. All anyone could completely agree on is that the trust in their fellow countrymen is rapidly draining, and the echoes of the brutal conflict seem to be moving into its place. So how do we get here? Why does Bosnia have three presidents? Why are outside powers trying so hard to keep a lid on Bosnia? And what happens if we leave this situation unchecked? Well, for that... We turn to our first guest. Part 1. A Piece in Pieces So, uh, essentially what we're dealing with is uh, a post-conflict situation in Southeast Europe, in the Balkans. Uh, You know, there was a very bitter and bloody war in the 1990s, and that led to the creation of what we see now, which is a a rather complex power-sharing agreement that was reached between the three main peoples of Bosnia-Herzegovina. So the largest single group are the Bosniaks, who we used to call Bosnian Muslims, who are just over about 50%. Uh, Then you've got the Bosnian Serbs, who represent about about 30%, and then you've got the Croats who are around 15%, and then you've got a few small other, but those are the three main um, groups that sort of uh, exist in the country. And um, we have a situation where relations have got um, steadily worse in recent years, to the point now that there's a real sense of concern that we could be looking at resumed conflict. James Kerr Lindsay is a visiting professor in the School of Politics and International Relations at the University of Kent, as well as an associate for the London School of Economics and Oxford University. He's also the host of the amazing geopolitics YouTube channel, James Kerr Lindsay, and I'm very happy to have my friend James on the show today. The 1990s were really focused, if you like, on on the Balkans. You know, the, these conflicts that we saw that, you know, Bosnia was the most b- bitter and brutal of, of, of those wars, but we also saw fighting, of course, uh, in, in Croatia. And then towards the end of the decade, we also had the, the, the fighting in Kosovo and the NATO bombing there. Um, but the world moves on. And what we saw, of course, in 2003 was there was this dramatic shift in the Middle East with the US invasion of Iraq. 
Uh, and there was a sense that, well, you know, the wars of the, the Balkans are over. Uh, the situation is stabilizing. The signs were looking fairly positive. So in Serbia, Slobodan Milosevic was no longer in power. Uh, there was reconstruction that was going on in, in Bosnia, that Croatia, well, Slovenia, had joined the European Union in 2004. Croatia was moving towards it. So there was a real sense that maybe things were starting to get better. And so there was this drawdown uh, in, in terms of numbers of troops of peacekeepers, but also, uh, you know, a, a sense of political direction, um, you know, shifted very much. And then things started to go wrong, that, you know, the, the progress that had been made started to slow down and in many cases actually start to reverse. And so, you know, that, again, is, is, is how we got to the situation that we are now. How the nation of Bosnia functions is incredibly complicated. The country is divided into roughly two separate entities, each one having about half the land, with these entities serving the three different people groups. The first being the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the second being the Republic of Srpska. Most of the ethnic Serbs live in Srpska, and the Croatians mostly live in the Federation areas. There is also a small Brčko district in the north, which is not part of either of the groups and tends to govern themselves. But for today's story, it's not going to play a central role, so let's not complicate an already overly complicated country. Because we already have enough complications when it comes to the leadership of Bosnia and Herzegovina. When it comes to the entire country, its leadership has three presidents at any time, a Serb, a Croat, and a Bosniak. And on top of them is a court of the high representative, which is supposed to oversee and mediate the three presidents in a highly decentralized country. This is one of the most complicated forms of government anywhere in the world, and it was set up in the peace agreements to be this complicated. So why did Bosnia and Herzegovina choose to go for this incredibly complicated system? At the end of the peace talks, why wouldn't they simply just allow Serbska to join Serbia and allow the Croatian past to join Croatia? You know, this is in many ways a, a, a degree of reflection of facts on the ground at the end of the fighting in, in 1995. Um, so I, we got to this situation that Bosnia had collapsed, that this very bitter war had broken out. You know, now now. People will get very unhappy if you call it a civil war because the, the Bosniak uh, position is that this wasn't a civil war. Uh, this was about manipulation from Serbia and from Croatia. Um, so they would call it an interstate war, you know, and, and as with so much in the Balkans, I mean, you know, this is obviously highly contested. But the reality is that we ended up with this situation where these three groups were fighting against each other. In early 1994, um, the United States was able to broker an agreement between the Bosniak, uh, the Bosnian Croats and the Bosnian Muslims, uh, and they created their own entity called the Federation, um, which has a number of cantons. And that's, you know, it, it's incredibly complex, this sort of power sharing agreement you have. But of course, uh, the Bosnian Serbs who'd, who'd broken away and were trying to secede and unite with Serbia had created this own entity of their own called Republika Srpska. And by the time we got uh, to the summer of 1995, we had the horrific events in, in Srebrenica, which really galvanised um, international attention. And I think there was this sort of sense that something really has to be done now to put an end to this. And at that point, the Bosnian Serbs basically held half of the country of Bosnia, and the price of getting a peace agreement was to cement that. And so this is what we, we really in many ways see. I mean, it's, it's, it's a reflection of the, the facts on the ground when the war came to an end 25 years ago. And of course, that has always been a great source of unhappiness for the, for the Bosniak community. They say, look, we're the largest group. Uh, half our country is held by the Bosnian Serbs. They don't really want to be part of our country, um, but we've given them the autonomy. And there are, in fact, a lot who now challenge the existence of Republika Srpska. You'll hear many people say, but this shouldn't, you know, this shouldn't be allowed. It's a product of genocide. And that in its own way is stoking a lot of the, you know, what we're seeing at the moment is because Bosnian Serbs are saying, well, you're talking about abolishing us. So we want to talk about breaking away. And it becomes this, this vicious circle. But that essentially is how we got into this situation um, of, of this very, very strange sort of patchwork where, you know, Bosnia is effectively created from two entities, a Serbian entity and then a joint Croat-Bosnian Muslim one. And within that joint Croat-Bosnian Muslim one, you've then got all these different patchwork quilt of, of, of cantons. 
It, it has an inordinate number of ministers and prime ministers and first ministers. Um, it, it, it's really, really quite quite incredible um, when you start to break down as a result of this this rather complex power sharing agreement that was created. So in some of the international analyst circles, there tends to be two types of opinions whenever the Balkans comes up. One group of analysts would say that we should relook at the lines on the maps and we should adjust everything in the region to match the modern day situation on the ground ethnically, meaning Serbs would live with the Serbs and Croats would live with Croats. Others would say that adjusting the Balkan maps is a giant Pandora's box. And the moment you open up that conversation, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Albania, Kosovo, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Romania, and Bosnia, who all have territorial claims outside of their current borders, would all seize the opportunity, with many of them looking to right some historical wrongs. Do you think either side's correct on this issue? It gets quite complicated because, of course, there are very different perspectives on we mustn't touch borders. So the, the, the position that the European Union and the United States will say is we mustn't touch borders. But of course, what we see is that the, the Serbs say, but that's absolutely hip- hypocritical because you've already done that. Uh, you know, you were quite happy to see Yugoslav disintegrate, uh, Yugoslavia disintegrate. So we can we can put the argument. Well, look, in actual fact, you know, it, it's considered a process of state dissolution, and they would say, well, that's just nicety. It was it was collapse, it, 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 it was secession, and that was permitted. Uh, but then you wouldn't let Bosnian Serbs and Serbs living in Croatia secede. But then you let the the, the Kosovo Albanians do so. And I think, you know, this is the problem that we run into. And and it, it gets quite difficult because the reality is, look, you know, I, I accept that Kosovo is independent. Uh, but if you go by the strict letter of international law and how things are understood um, in these situations, Kosovo's independence from Serbia is very contentious. I mean, there's a very good reason it's not a member of the United Nations and half the world doesn't recognise it. Whereas Montenegro, which had been a republic in Yugoslavia uh, and had broken away in effect with agreement of, of, you know, with Serbia, its partner at the end in in what remained of Yugoslavia, immediately joined the United Nations is fully recognised. And so I, I think this is the problem we have that, you know, when we talk about, oh, we mustn't change borders in, in, in the Western Balkans, um, you know, for many Serbs uh, in Bosnia and in Serbia proper, um, they would say, but that's just absolute hypocrisy. You've already done it. Um, but of course, if, if it's something that in any way is going to benefit the Serbs, then you're not going to do it. So it becomes a source of in, in really a lot of grievance. Um, and I think that some Sometimes, if we're to be really honest, we we haven't really taken that on board. Now, I mean, look, we can go back and we can discuss the brutality of the Milosevic regime. That's not in question. But if you start to sort of look at how uh, things unfolded and how we understand international law, um, it becomes a very, very complex picture. And that we we have already broken one of the cardinal rules of territorial integrity of states. And so, you know, the service again will come back and say, but you were fine to do it against us. But, you know, you're not fine to do it for us. So, yeah, it, it, it it's it's complex, but one can start to understand where where the grievances lie. Uh, but how we then deal with it is 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 a very, very difficult question to answer in its own right, because there is this argument um, that, you know what, we've got past that phase now where we want to change borders. So now it's a political decision not to do it. And to be honest, it's not a political decision I think necessarily makes a lot of sense. There was a, a possibility a few years ago of uh, readjusting the boundary border between Serbia and Kosovo. Uh, And that was something that because this argument that these borders are sacrosanct, you know, had had taken, you know, taken hold in in European and and to an extent in Washington, uh, was put off the table, this idea that you could change these these boundaries. And I actually happen to think, like a lot of people, uh, that this might have been uh, an option to explore. Um, but because there were a lot of people who said, but if you do this in, in, in Kosovo, then it's going to affect Bosnia, it was pushed off the table. And all it means now is we've still got an ongoing problem between Serbia and Kosovo, which I think needs to be solved, and the problem of Bosnia. And and to my mind, we don't solve Bosnia until we've solved Kosovo. So if we can't solve Kosovo, we're not going to solve it. it it's, it's just welcome to Balkan politics. Well, the reason this is all coming to a head at the moment is because of one man 
Milorad Dodik. Can you explain who Dodik is and why he's become a major part of this new complicated chapter in Bosnia? So Milorad Dodik is the leader of the Bosnian Serbs. He was president of Republika Srpska for a long time, and he's now um, the Serb member of the tripart uh, tripartite presidency uh, that exists in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So as I said, at the end of the war, they introduced a rather complex power sharing agreement, um, and that gives Bosnia this, this three-person presidency. And so Milorad Dodik sits on that. Um, but he is considered to be a hardliner, a nationalist, uh, and that, you know, in recent years, he's been making a lot of comments and statements towards the effect of, uh, I want to look at secession for Republic of Serbska. And that obviously has been causing uh, a lot of unhappiness. A lot of Bosniaks, again, are really, really, uh, you know, uh, opposed to the thought of Republic of Serbska breaking away. They see it as Ill illegitimate anyway, but, you know, secession is just beyond the pale. Uh, and in many ways, Dodik knows this and he's been playing on it. Um, but what we've seen is in the past six months is a dramatic turn of events, uh, a negative turn of events. And it, it, it sort of it, it, it's quite complicated, and it, it essentially revolves around the the Srebrenica genocide, which many Bosnian Serbs are, are very unhappy about being cast as a genocide. They feel that you know one it, it wasn't. Uh, they also see it as this is something that is being used by Bosniaks and by the international community to beat them uh, and and sort of you know humiliate them and and and, and things. So there's been a growing move uh, amongst many Bosnian Serbs to deny the genocide. And the high representative, so this international figure who was put in at the time of, of the settlement uh, to oversee the settlement and, and make sure that, um, you know, if there was disagreement between the parties, you know, they would have the, the power to introduce legislation. Uh, they could even get rid of officials if they felt that particular officials had been unruly. The outgoing high representative, someone called Valentin Insko, uh, literally in the last you know few days, weeks of his uh, term of office, is, um, which I believe was 12 years in the end, um, decided to introduce a piece of legislation outlawing genocide denial and making it punishable by uh, a term in prison. And this absolutely infuriated Dodik and in fact, you know, infuriated most Bosnian Serbs. And so Dodik, having been talking for a long time about um, the possibility of secession, now started to say, you know what, I'm, I'm actually going to repatriate powers. You have overstepped your mark as high representative, so I am now going to start um, reversing a number of the decisions that you and your predecessors made and um, repatriate powers that, to Republic of Serbska that we'd given to the centre. So, for example, this includes tax raising uh, functions, certain judicial functions, uh, intelligence. But most controversially, he actually said uh, that he was going to recreate a Bosnian Serb army. Now, one of the great, uh, if you like, um, advantages or great gains that we saw after uh, the Dayton Peace Agreement in 1995 was eventually the integration of the Bosnian Serb army into the Bosnian National Army. And so you can imagine, talk of doing that is raising concern amongst Bosniaks that are the Bosnian Serbs planning a new offensive? Are they planning um, to take matters into the hand militarily? And that now is becoming a source of concern. And what we're seeing also is Bosniaks then, you know, more hardline elements saying, well, if this is what they're going to do, we need to be prepared for war again. And so that, again, is feeding a lot of this real worry that we have now, um, that we could be seeing things move into a much more dangerous phase. Um, but of course, it's it's not clear what uh, Dodik is really up to in all of this, because the reality is, if Republic of Serbska declared independence, I mean, this is completely contrary to international law. It's not just that secession is banned. It's actually banned under the Dayton Peace Accord. Uh, and so it would be a violation of UN Security Council uh, resolutions. It's also been outlawed by the International Court of Justice, which has, you know, in, in, in other cases has looked at questions of secession and has come back and actually said, reiterated that Bosnia, you know, Republic of Serbska doesn't have the right of secession. Um, 
And so there is a sense that, one, it would be internationally uh, outlawed. Two, that it just couldn't really function if it did happen because... Um, you know, it would be completely isolated. If you look at a map that you can see a large chunk of its borders either are with the rest of Bosnia, which would be closed, that border or boundary. Uh, the border with, with Croatia would also be closed. So that would leave Serbia. So people would say, well, of course, Serbia is going to help it. But would it? Um, you know, if there was an international sanctions regime put on Bosnia, then is Serbia really going to want to break that? I mean, Serbia has made a huge progress over the past 20 years in terms of its relations with the West, you know, it's 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 now in the you know in the middle of its its EU accession talks. It's trying to keep hold of, of Kosovo. The last thing it wants to uh, be drawn back into is is Bosnia. So I think Serbia is looking very nervously at this. But you know, there is this sense that this is what Dodik is trying to do at the moment, and you know, this is this is creating a lot of nervousness because it isn't just talk of secession anymore that it is in actual fact moves that look as though that's been based towards it. But again, I think that moves towards secession are, are highly unlikely. Obviously, when it comes to Dodik, we're talking about Serbian nationalism here. But what about on the other side? Are we seeing similar pushes for devolution from Croatian nationalists, both inside Bosnia and Croatia proper? So matters are complicated because, you know, in a lot of conflicts, you're effectively talking about two parties. And that, you know, can be difficult how you balance that. But of course, in Bosnia, it's it's more complicated because it's a, it, it goes three ways. So the Bosnian Croats are obviously a lot smaller in number uh, than the Bosnian Serbs and, and the Bosniaks. Um, but they too also feel aggrieved. Um, so they look at the situation, and they say, well, look, the Bosnian Serbs have got their own entity, but we're forced into this very unhappy uh, marriage of the Federation with the Bosniaks. Um, we're significantly smaller. We would like our own entity. Uh, and so that's become um, a, a point that they've been very unhappy. I mean, it gets more complicated than that because they also argue that um, the Bosniaks were able to, um, if you like, gerrymander the election of a, a candidate for the Bosnian Croat member of the tripartite presidency that they don't actually feel is a legitimate representative of their interests. Um, that you know, it, it, it gets very complicated as to how sort of Bosnian electoral politics works. But essentially, you know, they would say this isn't somebody that we see as representing our our people. Um, so we have also these tensions, and I, I think what's become particularly interesting is that. We know that the relationship between, you know, the, the Serbs and the Croats hasn't always been easy. Um, but there seems to be signals that they, in the case of Bosnia, that there's common cause developing. Uh, and, that you know, the, the, the Bosnian Croats and the Bosnian Serbs are talking with each other, cooperating with each other. Uh, and this obviously is making the Bosniaks even more nervous uh, that they feel they've been caught in a pincer movement between the two. And so that in itself is also ratcheting up tensions at the moment. Uh, so, you know, Bosnia really, again, it's, it's an incredibly complex case. And it, it's, it's also the fact is that, you, you know, you, you, you're trying to manoeuvre all these different parts uh, and, you know, you might be able to solve a problem at a bilateral level between two of those parts, but then you throw it out of kilter on the third one, um, which just makes it all the more difficult to try and manage. With the stakes being so high, a lot of people are inclined to try and give concessions to both sides and avert a crisis here in the Balkans again. But do you think appeasement would actually solve this problem? Or do you think the loud nationalists on both sides would get a win and that would just set the stage for the next argument next year? Yeah, I think I think there is a worry uh, that if you sort of give in on on things, then it's going to make things more difficult. But the reality is that we know that there's got to be constitutional change in Bosnia. Um, there was a, a, a landmark ruling um, about a dozen years ago from the uh, European Court of Human Rights, uh, the Sadic Finci case, which is very important because essentially it argues that the, the Dayton peace agreement, the constitutional agreement that was put in place is contrary to, to human rights. Because essentially it means that if you want to have any sort of senior political position in Bosnia-Herzegovina, you've got to be identified as a member of one of the three main 
um, people. So you've got to be a Croat, you've got to be a Serb, or you've got to be a Bosniak. And this case, which was brought by some a member of the Jewish community in Bosnia and a, a member of the Roma community, said, but that's completely discriminatory. Why should we have to identify with one of these groups? in order to hold the highest positions in state. We are citizens of Bosnia, and the European Court of Human Rights agreed and said, Bosnia, you have got to adjust your constitution. Um, and of course, that has caused a lot of the problem because, you know, you, you come in and you say, well, what we've got to adjust the constitution to, to fit this ruling. And then everyone wants to bargain and says, well, look, if we're going to give in on something, what are we going to get in return? And so that's opened up this whole debate um, that we, we've seen in the country, which has complicated matters. Um, and so this is now taking us into this situation at the moment where how do we how do we fix all of this uh, and, you know, sort of put it all back in, you know, try and deal with these these fundamental underlying problems, but do it in a way that we can see some sort of movement forward uh, and, and taking the country. Because the, the key task in all of this, and, and people might say, well, why is this so important anyway? I mean, you know, Bosnia cannot proceed with EU membership unless it's seen to be in compliance with rulings of the European Court of Human Rights. This is incredibly important. This is fundamental um, to, to joining. So this is why it's so important that it, it, it meets all of this. But this has become a complicating factor in this whole story um, and, and why we can't see much progress being made on, on the talks. But what we can say in all of this is that there needs to be some bargaining. That much is clear. We can't just sit on the date and agreement. So people would say, well, look, if we're going to give him to Dodic, then it's opening up, you know, Pandora's box. It's going to sort of be, you know, we're going to then start having the Croats. But the reality is that we need to find a way of addressing the political problems in Bosnia. It needs restructuring. And that in turn becomes a real problem because, again, you see the bargaining. So any restructuring, what you're immediately going to have is the Bosnian Serbs saying, well, that restructuring, we should use this as an opportunity for even more decentralisation. We, we've we handed over a lot of powers to the centre. It's not working. We want to repatriate them or we feel that things can be done better. Of course, the Bosniak position is everything's failing in Bosnia because there's too much autonomy for Republika Srpska or they've got too much control at the centre. We need to centralise um, we need to centralise power, especially now that we're a majority and, and, and things like that. So that thinking is coming in. So it becomes really, really complicated. So one can say, yeah, look, are we giving in to Dodic's threats? Yes. Is that good? No. But at the same time, recognising that, you know, something has got to change and he's probably making his pitch as to what he wants to see in all of this. To say Balkan geopolitics is complicated is probably the understatement of the year. But what makes it worse is the fact that the scars are still very fresh in the minds of those involved. It was only two decades ago that thousands were dying in big batches, that entire villages were being burnt down just because of the nationality of whatever their parents were. The EU and the UN are desperate to avoid that, and there is a temptation to simply give the parties what they want. Nobody wants to play chicken with a lime grenade in the Balkans and then have it explode in their hands. So what do you do? Do you capitulate and become the Neville Chamberlain of the 21st century, giving in to nationalist demands as next demand comes and next demand comes and next demand comes? Or do you stand your ground and risk starting another horrific conflict right on the doorstep of Europe, one that is sure to tumble over into EU nations as well? Well, to talk about that, we turn to our second guest. Part two, the fallback line. Uh, you have um, a generation, you know, that was born uh, right after the war. These are kind of young students now. Uh, they hear stories from their parents and their grandparents. So they know what happened. And I think you can't escape, you know, the memories and the talk. The older generation clearly remembers what they went through. But I think in, in normal times, uh, war is not the first thing that's on people's minds. The problem that you see right now is is that because of the current political crisis and because of the calls um, by the Bosnian Serb de facto leader, Mirorad Dodik, who is a member of Bosnia's three-partite presidency, 
to kind of pull out the smaller entity, Republika Srpska, out of the defense agreement at the state level and join defense forces, the kind of memories of war are being revived again. This sort of discourse of pulling Republika Srpska out of Bosnia is very reminiscent of the discourse um, we had in the 90s, and it's kind of tapping into people's traumas and vulnerabilities. So obviously, it's kind of bringing back the memories. Maida Rugo is a senior fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, specializing in the former Yugoslav states. She's also a non-resident fellow at the SAIS Foreign Policy Institute and the Women in International Security Group. She joins us today. Well, there's certainly bigger separation than it used to be, you know, than it used to be in in pre-war Bosnia. So I think perhaps just a little bit as a background, Bosnia has kind of morphed from a highly intermingled patchwork, kind of multi-ethnic patchwork uh, prior to the war with high uh, percentage of inter-ethnic marriages and kind of a very, very a multi-ethnic tapestry, um, what happened in the war, there was an attempt to carve out ethnically, if you want, homogenous territories in eastern Bosnia and western Bosnia and annex these to Serbia and Croatia proper. So as a result of the war and ethnic cleansing, you basically transformed, Bosnia was transformed um, into a kind of collection of administrative units that are pretty much dominated in the east, Republika Srpska pretty much dominated by Bosnian Serbs, and then in the Federation, uh, an entity that is, you know, more mixed, uh, yet still you do have areas in, in various cantons in the Federation that are ethnically homogenous. So Dodik has put forward his proposal to pull the ethnically Serbian troops who were deployed in multi-ethnic units throughout the country all back to the Serbska areas and form units of purely Serbian forces, with ethnically Serbian units guarding the boundaries between the Republic of Serbska and the rest of the Federation. Would this be the beginning of internal hard borders inside of Bosnia if it were to go forward? No, absolutely not. I think, and this is what I say in every single discussion, this we, we need to define what this crisis is not about. It is not a a bottom-up phenomena. It is not some sort of a conflict between groups and desire by populations to separate. This is a very, very much a uh, top-down phenomena where you have a highly corrupt political leader who has I'm now talking about Milera Dodik, although he's not the only culprit, but he's at you know at the center of the crisis at the moment, and he is a political leader who has understood that the central government institutions that he cannot control um, can impose uh, an undesired degree of scrutiny um, and checks and balances of on the affairs. Um, in Republika Srpska, which he wants uncontrolled. And so much of this, um, what we're seeing right now, is a continuation of his salami slicing tactics to dismantle the institutions of the central government that can impose some sort of independent oversight. And so I think it's very important to separate Dodik's discourse and his real intentions. So when he talks about secession when he or he's now talking about secession from within he's talking about pulling out of most of the power sharing agreements at the central level of government and these institutions such as defense forces what he really is after is something else and what he's after uh, are issues that he doesn't mention as publicly Uh, so there's a question of state and defense property large amounts of agricultural land and forestry as well as defense property that need to be registered with the central government um, but that reportedly have been transferred illegally already to third parties um, putting um, Milor Dodik and his party in a very uncomfortable position and so much of this 
is really about um, kind of resources, dividing resources, as well as then eliminating those institutions at the central level of government uh, that kind of act as independent oversight. And here I'm talking, for instance, about Constitutional Court of BIH and international judges on the Constitutional Court. So we don't hear much of that, but this is part of Miller Dodic's tactics is to threaten the kind of big catastrophe in order to get concessions on smaller issues that are really of his interest. And they're not that small, but he's kind of proceeding piecemeal. And now we've seen the Croatian nationalists on the other side pushing for similar reforms for their people. The Croatian Nationalist Party in Bosnia, uh, HDZ, um, has for a long time been pushing um, for one specific reform, which concerns the reform of the election, election model for Bosnia's three-partite presidency. Uh, and... Um, it's a complicated constitutional and legal issue, but what it is basically about, um, it is about how the members of the presidency are elected through which model and whether there can be cross-ethnic voting or whether uh, the votes for the third member of the presidency, which comes from the Croat constituent people, can only be elected by votes in certain areas of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which HDZ, this political party, controls. So um, as kind of it, it, within this kind of big crisis that was staged by Milorad Dodik, which is about, you know, boycott of the central government institutions, threats to secede from within, at the same time, you have the Croat Nationalist Party pushing for the reform of the election law um, in a way that would really kind of gerrymander the electoral unit for the third member that comes from the Croat constituent people um, and which would ensure um, electoral victory for that one specific political party that holds monopoly in these regions. So you're now faced with a situation where the United States and the European Union have been convinced that unless they give in to some of these nationalist demands, Bosnia is going to kind of slide down further um, in dysfunctionality and chaos. And so, you know, they're trying to kind of work with the Croats on the election law reform. They're trying to get the Serbs back into the institution institutions. But so far from what we've seen, they're trying this more by appeasing the nationalist parties rather than signaling to them that consequences for failure to return to government and to actually act constructively will be severe. Surely if Dodik is making these big, bold moves, he must believe he has support to back his statements from somewhere. So is Dodik being encouraged by allies of his in Belgrade and Moscow to stir the pot in this situation? I don't think any of them need to fuel him. Dodik is, his, you know, he, he has their support, clearly. But in terms of, you know, initiative, I think we can't take away agency from Dodik. He has, he owns this. He's got agency in, in this situation and in the past situations. But what they're doing, of course, you know, they're supporting him. And so, you know, Moscow... There's lots of discussions on Russia as to, uh, oh, does Russia really care about Bosnia or not? Bosnia is not so important for Russia as is Ukraine, which is all correct. But the real question here is not so much is Bosnia as important for Russia as is Ukraine, but the question is how come that Russia, even with that little interest in Bosnia and with that little investment can implement so much damage and wants to. And the answer here is twofold. First of all, Russia is institutionally embedded in the implementation of the Dayton Peace Agreement and kind of post-war, if you want, state building in Bosnia. It has a seat in the Peace Implementation Council, 
um, which is kind of a collection of states that oversee the implementation of Dayton and are kind of almost um, some sort of a, a governing board for the high representative. Um, and so until now, Russia has always been part of the decision making on the ground. It has very often and almost as a rule boycotted most of the Western initiatives um, by either abstaining or putting in a little footnote on these resolutions that it's not in agreement, but then by lending political support to Doric and, you know, their other proxies on the ground. Um, Russia can very effectively weaken the political leverage of the West. And it, it has read the, the mood in the West correctly by also using its veto at the UN Security Council. Um, it has just done so this November when the yearly renewal of the U4 mission, so the U4 military mission that is responsible for maintaining safe and secure environment in Bosnia, is up for renewal at the UN Security Council every year. Um, Russia can veto this renewal and it has threatened to do so this year if it does not get concessions from the United States, UK and France on weakening of the office of the high representative. And also by doing so, it has blocked the current high representative from showing up uh, at the UN Security Council to present his report. So, you know, the question is, why is Russia doing this? And I think the answer is very kind of simple. First of all, it, Dodik's interests align very much with Russia's interests. Uh, Russia does not want to see Bosnia progress towards NATO. And it also does not want to see Bosnia have a coherent and functional decision-making system at the state level that could, for instance, pursue a foreign policy which is undesirable from the point of view of Moscow. So, you know, Russia here is more... Um, is not really an instigator, but it is a big player giving political backing to Dodik and making it very easy for him to pursue the strategy of obstruction. Dodik and the Serbian nationalists have been pushing for these sorts of reforms for years. So why is this making headlines now? What makes this time different to the, all the other times the Serbs have pushed for these sort of reforms? Um, this is a very good question. Indeed, Dodik has been threatening with one sort of secession or another since really he took office in 2006, but he started heavily uh, in 2008. And just to understand, for the past you know, 15 years, he has been always threatening with the worst case scenario, such as secession, in order to get concessions on issues mostly related to the rule of law. So one specific example is kind of in, in the late 2000s, he has pushed the international actors, you know, who were in charge of making these decisions, the US, the EU and the OHR, to not renew uh, the mandate of international judges sitting in the BIH court and prosecutor's office that were in charge of investigating cases of organized crime and corruption. And so that's very interesting. Dodik was insisting on the departure of international judges for crime and corruption, but not international judges for war crimes, which already tells you where his interests really lay. Um, and so what is different this time uh, well, I think there's two things. Uh, the first one is if you are allowed to continue with the salami slicing for 15 years, clearly the piece of salami you're left with 15 years later is much smaller. So the state of Bosnia and its institutions, and especially its rule of law system, has been significantly weakened. It's less resilient than it was in 2008. Um, and so you're dealing with a more difficult kind of situation in which the kind of domestic autoimmune system has been weakened. So that's one big difference. I think the second point is that he is continuing to read the mood in the West correctly. And he's aware that the United States is distracted uh, with many other foreign policy priorities, refocusing to Indo-Pacific, 
um, you know, there's multiple challenges coming from Russia, um, especially concerning the, uh, the massing of troops on Ukraine borders. So he's aware that the West will, you know, continue to try the quick fix solutions and and appease him in a way as it has been doing for the past, last 15 years. So I guess what is different this time is that you are just dealing with a state that has been weakened, that is less resilient, and that does not really have either internal uh, mechanisms or is blessed with a high-level political attention from outside that would be needed to push back and protect the very few mechanisms of defense that have been left. Bosnia now sits at a critical crossroads to decide which direction the country's future will lie. And much like almost everything else in Bosnian politics, the answer to that question will depend on who you ask inside the country. If you ask a Croatian Bosnian, they'll suggest the EU is the future. Why just look at Croatia proper? Croatians in Croatia have an average wage double that of Croatians living inside Bosnia. And since joining the EU, there's been a lot of EU investment into the country. Obviously, the EU is the way forward. If you ask the Bosniak, they may have a completely different answer. They may still look towards outside partners like Turkey and Egypt, suggesting that for a majority Muslim nation, other Muslim nations will be more respectful partners and understanding of what they're going through. That an ascendant Turkey may be a smart bet in a world where Brussels and Moscow are looking elsewhere. If you speak to the Serbs, though, they may look towards Russia or Serbia, stating that they're the only nations that will consistently defend them. Whether it be during the Yugoslav Wars or even during the First World War, it was Russia who backed the Serbs to the hilt. They would argue that whilst Europe and the US can be wishy-washy on various issues and have long since near abandoned this region of the world, Russia rarely takes its eyes off the ball. Moscow would have troops here in four hours if we asked, is what a Serb once told me. So... These three gents, now tied together in the national decision, have to make a choice on which way to go, none of which will be easy to agree upon. So what is the likely outcome? Which way will Bosnia go with its foreign policy? Will Bosnia be able to pursue three different foreign policies, or will one just drag the others kicking and screaming? What will answer that? We turn to our third guest. Part 3. Kicking the Can Bosnia is a beautiful, beautiful country with a fantastic capital, Sarajevo, incredible mountains, rivers, skiing, beaches a little bit of a stretch. Um, they must have at least five miles of coastline. Uh, but it, it is a, it's a lovely, friendly, warm place with a fantastic culture. The downside is that because of history, there are outbreaks of violence when they kill each other. Small numbers of them kill each other in large numbers. And until the differences between them are smoothed over, and that takes a number of factors and the passage of time, uh, I'm afraid we, we, we are still in a place where if things go wrong, things will go bang. Tim Marshall is a British journalist, author and broadcaster, reporting for Sky, the BBC, LBC and IRN, specialising in foreign affairs. Having been a war correspondent in the Balkans during the wars and writing probably the most famous contemporary book on geopolitics, Prisons of Geography, Tim has also gone on to write Shadowplay, all about the Balkan wars and the struggle for Kosovo. Tim is one of the biggest household names around when it comes to geopolitics and having been reporting for the front line for years, we are thrilled to have him on the show today. There's two real answers to your question. The first is probably the more important. If a Croatia effectively annexed the mostly Croatian speak uh, cultural part, people who identify as Bosnian Croat, and if Republika Srpska became independent and then probably joined itself onto Serbia, thereby uh, changing an international boundary, and there would not be, a, I'm not sure that the Bosniak area would be viable in any way. The capital is, is, is you know, absolutely full of all three peoples. 
Well, if you've done that, what is then to stop Kosovo joining Albania and then Serbia saying, we are not having that because part of Kosovo is, is still Serb majority in the north? What is to stop the Kosovo, excuse me, the Macedonian Albanians from saying, well, we want to restart trouble that was caused in 2000 and attach ourselves to to Albania and on you go. So essentially the answer is um, you change national borders uh, at great risk. The other answer is simply that, that Bosnia has not chosen to do that, that it is still just holding together as a viable state and it has the right to remain so and to remain a country and it's not for the outside world to, d to dictate to it what it is and it isn't. Of those two, I think the first one is the stronger argument, sadly. In the mid-90s, the eyes of the world were fixated upon the Balkans, but since things have calmed down, much less attention is being spent on this area of the world, particularly after the US left in 06. Why do you think Bosnia has moved to the periphery for most of the people in the West? And do you think this latest round of tensions will bring the Balkans back onto people's radars? You're right. Uh, after Dayton, <clears throat> 95, which didn't end the conflict as much as freeze it, people absolutely took their eye off the ball of the Balkans in general. Hence, the Kosovo War uh, broke out. It may have broken out anyway, but you know, people came back to focusing on it too late. And then after the Kosovo War, <coughs> after 2001, notably 2001 and 9-11 and everything that flowed from that, well, there simply didn't appear to be enough bandwidth for the world powers to pay attention to the Balkans. So again, attention has drifted. Then you fast forward up to, say, the last three or four years, where a number of things, such as post-financial crash of 2008, Brexit, and now COVID-19, and again, the EU's attention is elsewhere and also the ambition to bring the Balkan countries into the EU has faded, especially as they haven't yet um, come up to the, the, the sort of standards required to get into the EU. So again, the, the people's eyes have gone off the ball. Hence, outside players such as Russia does start to concentrate and internal players such as the uh, Republika Srpska they begin to see perhaps they can test the waters again, which is what they're doing. Uh, I mean, they're playing with fire. One or two alarm bells have sounded, but mostly I don't think that most of Europe is aware of what's going on in Bosnia at the moment and the tensions there which are rising. Dodik has been quite bold in a number of his proposals here, which would probably suggest that he does have tacit support from some of his larger partners to fall back upon. Do you think Dodik is the one putting forward these reforms for himself, or are partners in Moscow or Belgrade pushing him to test the waters in Bosnia? I don't think he could do it without them. Um, they haven't got enough backing. I mean, there is some backing for Dodik in, um, in Serbia, but it wasn't the Serbs who gave, um, I think it was 10,000 assault rifles, and gave them to the Bosnian Serb police force, and actually more some machine guns as well, I believe, the sort of heavy weapons that a police force doesn't require, and trained some special forces and funded helicopters. So you've got to ask yourself, why would Russia do that? I mean, Russia isn't going to waste its time on something that it thinks it has no, uh, no gain out of, but it can see that as the tensions are rising, as the Europeans and the Americans' attention is elsewhere, that it, it does not want Bosnia ever even getting close to joining the European Union. And the more of a mess it's in, the, the, the less chance there is of that. And their only entry into that is the Serbian part of Bosnia. So they are getting themselves into that. Um, why would they miss this opportunity? You know, I completely understand the Russian perspective. I don't agree with it, but I completely understand that Putin, his life's work, uh, other than enriching himself, is to roll back the effects of the dissolution um, of the Soviet Union. 
And part of that is to roll back out Moscow's influence as far as it can go uh, in, in areas which were previously... I mean, obviously, Yugoslavia did break with Russia, but it was still ballpark part of that world. And here is an opportunity for Russia to, to um, sink its claws back in to, to this area. If things do continue to escalate, do you think we might see Moscow offer to put peacekeepers or troops on the ground in Bosnia to try and quell the situation, much like they have in Nagorno-Karabakh at the moment? Why not? Um, who's to stop them? I mean, you remember um, back in 1999, which, which for me was the high watermark of European and American uh, absolute dominance uh, of, of Europe and it was the moment where the Russians said okay that's it enough you know they'd stood by and watched as uh, parts of Bosnia were bombed uh, mostly by the Americans and how the Americans basically came in and, and stopped the Bosnian war um, and they weren't, weren't prepared to put up with it any longer and not everyone knows but it is strongly thought that it was Putin who was a senior advisor to Yeltsin at the time, who whispered into Yeltsin's ear, we cannot have this. And so right at the very end of the Kosovo War, as NATO was uh, on the border of Macedonia waiting to advance into Kosovo, the Russians just got in their armoured cars, a column of about 80 of them, and just drove out of uh, Bosnia and drove all the way down and entered into Kosovo and took up positions at the, um, at the airfield. I mean, I, that, at that moment, they announced themselves, I think, back on the world stage. Sorry, I mean, that's almost ancient history now. But I think it's an example of the type of bold action that Russia, and Putin especially, is prepared to take if he thinks that the, the stars are aligned. And um, so it, it is quite plausible that if um, their fellow Slav, Russian speak, well, um, Slavic speaking people are in, uh, in danger from their perspective in Republika Srpska, why not have the Russians there? After all, everyone else would be there. The Americans and the Europeans would no doubt be anxious seeing Russian troops west of Kaliningrad again. So what do you think Washington's reaction would be to Russian peacekeepers rocking up in Bosnia? Oh, they, they wouldn't be happy with it at all. But, um, you know, I'm not sure they could prevent it. There are um, small airfields in Republika Srpska. Um, they can just fly in. Uh, and Republika Srpska can say, well, we are a semi-autonomous or autonomous region. Um, we can have whoever we want flying in, thank you very much. So, uh, you know, I'm not, not sure they could be stopped, especially if they did, some of them said... Well, you can fly into Belgrade if you want. After all, it's only 100 miles across to the border. So I don't think it matters if the Americans said, you know, we don't, we don't like this. And you could argue, do the Americans have any more right to send peacekeepers there than, than the Russians do? Uh, so the, the Americans are beginning to concentrate on this. They have warned uh, Dodek not to declare independence and not to uh, form a, a fully-fledged army, but I, st I still think that at the moment the bandwidth, given the issues of the South China Sea and Ukraine, uh, I don't think the bandwidth bandwidth is there. So, you know, it, it continues to simmer. Supply flights from Russia to Serbia that would be required to make a peacekeeping operation like that viable would have to enter the airspace of either Romania, Hungary or Bulgaria, all of which are NATO partners. Would NATO be able to close the airspace to Russian transports to prevent the deployments into the Balkans. Uh, do they really want to test the Russian bear that much? I mean, you know, look, Ukraine is a far, far bigger issue for the Americans. And personally, I think that if the Russians cross the border, and I'm not sure they will, but, you know, we will find out sometime next year, I don't think the Americans would, would, would get involved overtly militarily there so i cannot see them uh, doing the same thing in in bosnia especially if you're talking about um you know they are becoming as peacekeepers one nation in all of this people tend to overlook a lot is turkey who have been investing more and more time and effort into balkan states like north macedonia bulgaria and albania so does turkey have a vested interest in the bosnian conflict as well Yes, but it's, it's, it's commercial. I mean, there are the historical ties. I mean, they were there at one point. Um, that's why there are so many Muslims uh, in, in, in Bosnia. 
But their interests are mostly commercial and strategic influence. I mean, they, they, they would also probably offer uh, peacekeeping troops in the event that this goes bang. I mean, you know, we, we're not there yet. I, I don't want to over-egg that, that pie. You know, you don't know how much Dodek is... is um, and indeed the Croatians, I hasten to add, you know, they are they are not exactly pouring... Um, uh, they're not trying, just trying to calm the waters particularly. Um, but no, Turkey has a, an, an awful lot of commercial interests in the Balkans, and it's grown them in the past 20 years, and it wants to safeguard those commercial interests. It also sees itself as, at the very least, extending its influence back out into what was uh, parts of the Ottoman Empire. I and mean, we've seen them going in the other direction. You know, They are in Iraq, they are in Syria, they're even in Libya, which of course they were during the Ottoman time. Uh, and they, they have ambitions to go in the other direction as well. But as I said, that's mostly on the commercial side. So if this conflict does begin to head south, one of the big questions would be around NATO's role. Croatia is a member of NATO and so can trigger Article 5 if they are attacked. So would NATO or the EU come to the support of Croatia if the conflict turned ugly? And if so, how could they ever be seen to be neutral in any future negotiations? Only if Croatia was not seen itself to be uh, doing machinations to um, actually carve a bit of Bosnia out for itself. And there are suspicions that is what it's doing. I, I mean, certainly if Croatian troops got involved inside the borders, I don't think that's any reason for NATO to get involved because that's not an Article 5 issue. You know, that's not an attack on a NATO partner. Um, in the event, I mean, this isn't going to happen, but in the event of um, troops in Bosnia invading Croatia, yeah, that would be an attack on a NATO partner, but that, that's not really a scenario. So if NATO felt that Croatia was acting responsibly and not actually acting in order to potentially uh, further the breakup of Bosnia and then all the knock-on effects that we've already discussed, I think they would, they would support them, at the very least politically. The EU would be slightly different. Um, the EU, because of the factions within it, does tend to sometimes take sides. I mean, a good example at the moment is, is, is Greece and, and its issues with Turkey. I mean, France is backing uh, Greece to the hilt, even sent its aircraft carrier down to the Med, uh, to the Aegean last year in support of Greece. Whereas one or two other EU countries, you know, are not particularly keen on, on Greece. And um, I wouldn't say they're siding with Turkey, but they're not siding with their fellow EU member. I wanted to pose a bit of a frankly not unlikely scenario. If ethnic tensions boil over sometime early next year and riots do break out in some of the major cities, as they have in the past, how likely would it be for the two groups to turn to their larger partners? So the Republic of Serbsko calling to Serbia proper to send troops to protect Bosnian Serbs against the riots or Croats turning to Croatia proper to send troops to save Bosnian Croats from the riots. And as a bit of an extension to the question, if one country does send troops across the border to act as peacekeepers, will the other feel obligated to do the same? Yeah, if it gets to a certain extent, that is what would happen. But I mean, this is... Um cause and effect, and also what is the chain of events. And you'd hope, I mean, I wrote an article recently opening with a, a provocative statement, uh, deliberately saying, let's send a thousand NATO troops to Bosnia now. And that's because it's not a great expense to send a thousand NATO troops. And it's certainly cheaper doing it now than it will be to send 20,000 in a couple of years time. Because in the scenario that you've just uh, said, um, riots, okay, that's for the police uh, to, to, to put down and control, and then wise heads get round tables and say, calm down. And if they don't, and they get worse, you've got a problem, because at that point, militias begin to form. And then at that point, you've got a risk of a gunshot. And once the first person dies, you could be up and running. And I'm not sure that the... the, the um, outside forces that are there at the moment are capable of, of standing between uh, different sides. So why not, why not send people earlier rather than later? If they haven't done that, sent people in earlier, and it has got out of hand, it would be difficult uh, f at the very least for the Croats 
not to arm the Bosnian Croats, and indeed for Serbia not to arm the Bosnian Serbs, either openly or clandestinely. Well, what is stopping NATO putting their troops on the ground at the moment? Well, A, they're not really concentrating. Um, I mean, you know, old Bosnian hands are, uh, and I include in that the former British Foreign Secretary William Haig, who um, I'm absolutely sure he didn't read my article on the Friday, but I noticed he wrote uh, his column for The Times on the Monday, pretty much saying, let's send some NATO troops in now. So, you know, the people that follow these things, um, the alarm bells are going, but the, let's be fair, they're few and far between. It's not the uh, the most glamorous uh, part of the world to try to uh, make your career in if you're a uh, foreign office, journalist, um, NGO, really. So I, I still don't think people are aware of, of the dangers. Um, so that that's one reason. Two... There is an issue for people that are thinking about it. You know, might you make things worse? Might you actually increase tensions? I don't think so. I, th- I think you can do it with very little fanfare. Um, you know, you don't have to have a big parade march through town the day you arrive. Uh, I, I think it would be prudent to do that because, again, you know, the scenarios that you and I have just put together, and they, that's all they are. You know, we're just talking on a podcast when, you know, we're not forecasting that this is going to happen. But it, it is one of the scenarios that you could see. Listen, another scenario. This all calms down. Dodek winds his neck in. The Croats calm down a bit. And they go back to the, uh, the status quo of it's not really resolved, but we're not going to do anything about it again. To kind of underscore how important it is to project this right, though, if it does go badly and shots are exchanged, how likely are the other Balkan nations that do have territorial disputes in the Balkans, like Macedonia, Kosovo and Albania, to seize the opportunity while Serbia is tying up and settle some old scores. If there were border changes, either through force of arms or the outside powers pretty much imposing terms essentially on the Bosniaks, because they would be the ones who'd be left without a state. I mean, you know, there are Bosnian Serbs who would be quite happy to join Serbia. There are Bosnian Croats who would be quite happy to be part of a greater Croatia. But you'd be hard pushed to find a Bosnian Muslim who wanted to be um, a member of either of those countries, especially if they're forced to be. So, you know, what what are they left with? Uh, virtually nothing. So if it's seen that either by diktat from the outside world or through force of arms that the borders have changed, and I think at that point, that's the sort of thing, you know, I just don't see what is to stop Albania and Kosovo or, or nationalists within Albania and Kosovo beginning to foment trouble. And indeed, you know, I mean, I was there in 2000 in Macedonia. Um, I mean, nobody remembers this uh, because it wasn't Kosovo, which was the year before, which was, you know, the biggest story of the year. It was a little sideshow. NATO came in, clamped it after only a few hundred deaths uh, and, and put into place a system which has held but there, there do remain people who will be quite ready to rejoin all the militias. There's a new generation of young nationalists on both sides. And the, the, the problem is, is that if they did get going again and they did join parts of Macedonia, which is Kosovo, Macedonia, and onto Kosovo, and then the whole lot onto Albania for the greater Albania, at that point, what is left of Macedonia, the Slavic-speaking um, bit of it, that's probably not viable as well. At which point, well, Serbia could well step in and say, perhaps you ought to be part of us. And Bulgaria might want to say in this. And then you've just gone straight back to 1912. If the consequences are so dire, some would argue, why even risk blowing it up? There have been a handful of EU spokesmen who have suggested appeasing Dodic is the safest option going forward. But I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on agreeing to the nationalist demands. Will it actually take the heat out of the situation, or is it simply just kicking the can down the road? As if, as if they would stop there once they had a, um, uh, an army, and a well-armed one, and they basically said, screw you, to the high representative, who's already lost influence be, be, because um, he was... I don't know if you know the background, you probably do... There was the vote at the UN to renew the mandate for outside forces, but there was zero reference to the high representative. Now, every year for the past 20 years, 
the High Representative is always mentioned in order to bolster the position to say this is, uh, you know, everything channels through him. But the Chi- I think it was the Chinese and, and the Russians who got it taken out and the other countries um, were, were weak. And so they, at a stroke, they undermined the authority of the um, the High Representative. And so Dodok, having essentially humiliated him, got his police force uh, autonomous, created an army. Moscow, seeing that um, they've made some, some, some small tactical gains, why would they stop there? And my final question, do you think Bosnia and Herzegovina will still be on the map in 20 years' time? I think there'll be a Bosnia and Herzegovina in two years. I can't really see much past that because it's a fluid situation. I mean, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because if you say, will there be a Turkey in 20 years? The answer is almost certainly yes. Um, Will there be, you know, I can pick almost every country in the world, 193 of them. And the answer, you know, you don't have to think very hard is yes. There, There are countries in the world where you just can't be so sure. Ethiopia, for example, And Bosnia, I don't think, is in the dire straits that Ethiopia is. What needs to happen is call Dodex Bluff, put in more investment, give them some encouragement that they're going to join the EU and and help to create the conditions to join the EU because the better off they are, the less chance there is of them um, tearing each other apart. To call or to fold? Should we call Dodik out on his threats? On one hand, NATO has the Macedonia solution. Go in hard, go in fast, stamp out any sparks of violent nationalism. The solution worked. It stopped Macedonia devolving into much the same ethnic conflict endured by its former Yugoslav compatriots. But at the same time, is that NATO's job? If you said yes to putting NATO troops on the ground to defuse ethnic battles, why not deploy NATO troops to Ethiopia? Why not deploy them to Rwanda during the genocide? Why not deploy them to Armenia and Azerbaijan as well? Does NATO have the right to walk in somewhere like Bosnia because Brussels knows best? On the other hand, NATO's absence and a lack of intervention turned Kosovo into one of the worst displays of humanity during the 20th century. Would the 14,000 lives lost in the Kosovan War still be here today if NATO had intervened quickly before the situation became unmanageable? Would the Yugoslav Wars have been a much more peaceful intervention if NATO had managed their exit from communism the same way that East Germany or Czechoslovakia had been? This is a moral question, and one that will need to be answered soon. As with each passing day, the rhetoric of the nationalists becomes more and more venomous. And the window for the option of early intervention is rapidly beginning to close. Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week. We just came off another record-breaking month for listenership in November. And we really cannot thank you all enough for your support and help of the show. It's also December here at the Red Line, so we've been busier than ever with our end-of-year celebrations. With our second round of Hearts of Iron last night, and our geopolitics pub quiz and geoguesser game coming up this weekend. If you want to find out more about these events, or you want to keep up to date with everything we're up to, you can find all of our links on our Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, and Discord on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or if you're keen to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Hilliard Oz. Oz is in Australia. This episode is dedicated to our Patreon, Thomas Berkowitz, who is the latest Patreon to sign up at the time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of our listeners like Tom, who donate a small amount of money each month to help us keep this show going, and we cannot thank them enough. If you feel you could spare a couple of dollars, we'd greatly appreciate it. So Thomas, this episode is dedicated to you. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first book is the new book from friend of the show, Tim Marshall, the new bestseller, The Power of Geography, a follow-up from his other amazing previous book. Whilst on Tim Marshall as well, I would also recommend reading Shadow Play, Tim's book on the Yugoslav Wars and his time covering the conflict. It's a fantastic read from start to finish. The second book recommendation is The Dissolution of Yugoslavia, The History of the Yugoslav Wars, 
and the political problems that led to Yugoslavia's demise, for a history of the period that led to the collapse and fighting in Yugoslavia. The third is from another friend of the show, Robert D. Kaplan, called Balkan Ghosts, focusing on how the events of the Balkans tend to shape the politics of Europe. I want to thank this week's guests, James Kerr Lindsay, Maida Ruger, and Tim Marshall. I could not have possibly asked for a better panel on this subject, and it was a pleasure having you on the program. Also, I want to thank my staff, Owen Swift, the producer, Daniela Zavella and Perry Gray's our research assistants and writers, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent, as well as our two new staff who joined the team this week, Jonah Gunn and Ross Crabtree. We are thrilled to have you both join the team. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit the Redline Podcast dot com.